Well, thank you very much for your very kind invitation and for being here to, tonight. Um, indeed, it's going to be about the, the inflation episode we are going through uh, at the moment, not just in the UK, but in other leading economies. And my main uh, thesis is going to be that uh, it was central banks uh, creating the current inflation episode that we're, we're living. Um, first, a few notes on what we mean by inflation. Uh, you wouldn't be surprised, uh, the members of the Mises Society, if I may make some clarifications about what inflation is. Uh, quite uh, many people, even specialists in economics and macroeconomics, and indeed policy commentators and uh, media specialists, they refer to inflation as changes in sectoral prices. So it's all about, uh, now it's all about energy prices, for example, uh, bottlenecks in supply, supply chains uh, leading to uh, uh, changes or increases in some prices, some relative prices, in particular energy prices indeed. But this is not inflation. By inflation we mean a change in the price level. Hmm? Uh, prices in the economy, in the market economy, they change by, by the hour, if you like. Uh, as long as uh, the level uh, of uh, prices stays the same, well, that's not inflationary. That's just an adjustment of uh, relative prices. I know that it sounds very, uh, how can I put it, introductory, but we need to make this claim in order to distinguish what a change in sectoral or relative prices is as compared to a change in the price level, in the overall price level. And the second point that I would like to, to make from the beginning is that we cannot uh, possibly think that we can control inflation at all times uh, uh, in the very short term. The best we can do is to look into, in my opinion, monetary uh, variables and try to extract uh, trends over the medium to long term. So the approach that I'm going to follow here is what's the effect of changes in the amount of money broadly defined in order to uh, identify trends in inflation over the medium to long term. What do I mean by medium to long term? 1.5 to 2 years. That's the best we can do, in my opinion. So whatever is going, uh, whatever is going on now with inflation has to do with uh, what happened to the amount of money uh, 12 or 18 months ago. Hmm? Well, this is the, um, the question that uh, we need to answer to. Uh, on, the, on the top of the, of, the, of the slide you have the, the balance sheet of the, of, the, um, of the Bank of England. That's the Bank of England's consolidated balance sheet. And as you can tell since, well, uh, the, the, the global financial crisis and indeed uh, with COVID-19, it has increased quite notably. Um, in, from 2008 until 2000, and, well, just before the start of the pandemic, uh, it was a continued increase over time. Hmm? And uh, starting in March uh, 2020, the Bank of England uh, resumed uh, uh, the uh, asset purchases programs, and that had an impact, of course, in the size of the, of the Bank of England's balance sheet. The question that we need to answer, in my opinion, the most uh, uh, important policy question is why the first increase in the balance sheet over a few years, over 10 years, was not inflationary, whereas the, 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 the last uh, or the latest increase in the, in the balance sheet has indeed been inflationary. As you can tell here in this line, this is CPI inflation in the UK, from 2008 until 2019 there has been, if anything, a disinflationary uh, trajectory uh, in the UK. At the same time, uh, the balance sheet of the, of the Bank of England has indeed increased quite a lot. That changed after 2021. After 2021, we had both an increase in the balance sheet of the Bank of England and indeed inflation. So why? Why is that the case? This is the major policy question we need to answer and I will try to address that, address that question today in, the, uh, in my presentation. In order to, to address the topic, I do believe that we need to make a distinction uh, between uh, different measures of money. This is key to understanding why in the last few years we have suffered from, from inflation. And I will just make a, a very basic distinction between a narrow definition of money versus a broad definition of money. By narrow, I mean anything close to the monetary base, M0, however you want to define it, but something that includes uh, cash in circulation plus banks' reserves at the National Central Bank. A very reduced form 
of the supply of money in the economy. How reduced? Well, normally it's around 5%, five, if you like, up to 10% of the total amount of means of, payment, of, means of payments in a, in a modern economy. Hmm? Whereas, in my opinion, what is much more relevant for, for policy purposes, broad money includes cash in circulation plus bank deposits, the vast majority of the liabilities of the commercial banking sector. Why is this relevant, in my opinion, this distinction? Because the, 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 the vast majority of us, I would say, we do use uh, the latter broad money when we make a transaction. Uh, well, it's very rare that now people use, I don't know, 100 pounds or more, even, even, even less if it is my, my more than 100 pounds for, uh, in cash uh, to settle a transaction. What you would use is a debit card, a credit card, or anything else, or a transfer, a bank transfer. When you do that, what you do is to transfer a deposit from your account into somebody else's deposit. And that involves no monetary-based money at all, no narrow money. The vast majority of the exchanges that we have in the modern economy uh, are uh, exchanged through uh, uh, the interaction of broad money. Hmm? And again, broad money is cash in circulation plus uh, uh, bank, uh, bank deposits. This is roughly 90 to 95% of the total means of payments uh, available in a modern economy. As I said from the beginning, the approach that I'm going to uh, take is how changes in the amount of money broadly defined affect inflation over the medium to long term. This is something that we can uh, structure around the, the equation of exchange, if you like. But it's not just uh, a truism exposed, of course it has to be true, but it can be a theory if we hypothesize about uh, some of the elements within the within the equation, and that's what I will be doing today. Mm? For uh, M, I understand the quantity of money broadly defined, not the, not the monetary base, but something closer to M3 in the US, M4 in the UK, uh, something that includes the vast majority of uh, bank deposits. Money velocity, and this is something that I will really pay attention to because this is one of the key elements in the quantity theory of money, or the inverse of the demand for money. P for the price level, it should be all prices in the economy, but just for the uh, purposes of today's uh, uh, explanation, I'm going to proxy P by, by the CPI. Hmm? I know that it's a reduced uh, basket of goods and services, it's not all prices in the economy, but for the purposes of today's discussion, it's, it's good enough. And T for transactions, rather than total transactions, I'm going to proxy that uh, by the GDP in real terms. Hmm? So, the way to interpret this equation in this case would be uh, the total amount of money in the economy times the demand, the inverse of the demand for money or the uh, money velocity must be equal to the nominal value of the GDP in the economy, nominal spending. If you like, we can put it in the form of uh, rates of change. Uh, that's why I used uh, small caps here. So the rate of growth of money uh, plus the rate of change in money velocity will be equal to the rate of growth of inflation or deflation plus the rate of growth of the economy. Hmm? There are several misconceptions, in my opinion, about uh, the quantity theory of money. It is criticized for well, many reasons. Uh, here I just mentioned uh, three. The first one is that uh, for the quantity theory of money to function properly, money velocity has to be fixed. Well, I will show you that it, it doesn't have to, hmm? but that's one of the claims that of the critics of the quantity theory of money, that it has to be fixed. No, it doesn't. The second one is that uh, quite often uh, the, the, the definition of money that they use to test for the validity of the quantity theory of money is a very narrow definition of money. In my opinion, this is uh, a flawed approach to the quantity theory of money. Mm -hmm. And secondly, uh, quite many people claim that uh, if uh, changes in the amount of money do not translate into inflation uh, immediately, that uh, basically just refutes uh, the quantity theory of money altogether. Well, that's not the case. There is a delayed effect of changes in the amount of money onto prices. These effects are not automatic at all. As I said before, you need to uh, adopt a, a medium to long-term approach to assess changes in the amount of money, how they affect uh, inflation over the medium to long-term. So I'll go through the, the three points uh, briefly. And if you like, uh, please ask me uh, questions at the end, if you, if you may, about any of them. This is regarding the, 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 the which monetary aggregate to use in order to assess inflation. Hmm? This is that solid line is CPI inflation. 
uh, in the US in the aftermath of the before and in the aftermath of the global financial crisis. And the shady area is the, uh, well, is the monetary base in the, in the US. Hmm? It's the balance sheet, the size of the balance sheet of the, of the Federal Reserve. As you can tell, there was a huge uh, explosion uh, in, the, in the size of the monetary base right uh, during the years of the global financial crisis, 2008, 9 and 10, if you like. And in those years, inflation did not increase, actually decelerated and actually <laughs> uh, came into the negative territory. There was deflation uh, for a few months in the US. Hmm? So indeed, by focusing on a very narrow definition of money, you are not going to, to assess inflation. You're not going to get it right. If you want to assess inflationary pressures in the economy, rather than a, a narrow definition of money, I would suggest that you have to use a much broader uh, definition of money like M3 growth. Hmm? If you use M3 growth, this is the discontinued line here, then you can tell that in those years, in the global financial crisis years, the amount of money, the actual amount of money in the economy did not increase that much, actually decelerated and actually decreased. It fell for a couple of terms. And I claim that that explains the fall in inflation during those years. So again, if you want to assess inflation, it is much better to use a much broader definition of money, hmm? much better than the narrow, a narrow definition of money for sure. Hmm? How about um, money velocity? This comes from um, an empirical study that I, I, um, uh, I did with a colleague of mine um, uh, using a 100 years uh, database of money velocity in the, in the US. So we're going back to the, uh, the aftermath of the First World War up to the pandemic years. As you can tell, indeed, money velocity fluctuates. It is not stable at all. It's not fixed, that's for sure. It's just an empirical fact that it's not uh, uh, fixed. And it was much more volatile before the 1950s. Hmm? Afterwards, it has become much more stable. But the property in the series, the technical uh, the property in the series that matters uh, the most for us is that the series is stationary. It's mean reverting, which means Yes, it does fluctuate upwards and downwards, but on average, it reverts to the mean. So eventually, it, it, will, it will revert to the average value, which is roughly minus 0.8% pre-COVID data or minus 1.1% if we include uh, the COVID episode. Why is this uh, so relevant? If we were assessing inflation or deflationary pressures back in the midst of the pandemic in 2020, and we observed this huge fall in money velocity, well, if we knew at that time that a money velocity would eventually return to, to an average value, we would know that uh, it wouldn't be here forever. <laughs> eventually, money velocity would uh, recuperate, would return to something much more reasonable, let's put it that way. Okay? That was very extraordinary. As you can tell, well, in no other time in history, money velocity had declined that much. And why did it happen? Well, we know that it was a huge, uh, well, it was a time of, uh, with a huge uncertainty about the future of, uh, not just the economy, the future of life, if you, if you, if you may. Uh, so people did uh, uh, um, run for liquidity. That means there was a huge fall in the, in the demand, for, uh, sorry, a huge fall in, in money velocity because there, there was a huge increase in the demand for money. And that's what this value is reflecting. But again, the key point here is, yes, it does fluctuate, but it returns to its mean eventually. Hmm? And no, uh, it's, uh, it's not right to say that uh, changes in the amount of money uh, have an automatic effect on inflation. That's, uh, that has never been the case. Yeah? It takes time. And these are the, the, the delays, uh, uh, the, the, the time lags observed in the US economy. It will have, it's country specific, I appreciate that, but this is something that we can take as a benchmark for a leading economy. So, Say that there is an excess in money balances. Monetary policy has become too loose and uh, there is too much money, as if it were, in the economy. That will have an effect first in asset prices. So um, uh, uh, any, any asset manager uh, uh, holding a portfolio of uh, assets will have too much cash in their portfolios. And that too much cash uh, in their portfolios is not good news. They are not uh, getting any revenues out of it. 
So they will what they will try to do is to diversify, to get rid of that excess in cash by investing in other alternative non-monetary assets. When they do that, they will be increasing the demand of other assets. That's why it's not a, it's not a coincidence that uh, whenever there's an excess in money uh, balancing in the market, in financial markets in particular, there is an increase in the appetite for other alternative assets with, uh, which uh, pushes up uh, uh, asset prices. That's why at the worst of the pandemic, in the spring, summer 2020, the economy was plummeting and yet uh, the stock market uh, recovered very, very quickly. Hmm? That's something we observed in a question of weeks or even months. Hmm? Once the value of the company's assets is, uh, is much higher than before, because we have asset price inflation, then companies will be much more willing to invest, to expand their businesses, to hire more people. It will take more time, possibly two to three quarters more, but eventually both companies and individuals, households, will be in a better position because of asset price inflation uh, to spend more, to hire more people, to borrow more money. That will increase uh, nominal spending. Whenever that happens, especially in the context of the pandemic, but it doesn't have to be such a radical scenario, we have an increase in demand that cannot be accommodated by supply. And indeed, that will be inflationary. So the problem that I have, it's not that I have it, that I think it's not right actually, with uh, explanations of inflation that focuses only uh, on the last stage that I just explained, is that uh, they claim that inflation is just a demand uh, side factor. Well, yes, but you need to look at what's, what happened before that. <laughs> Ultimately with uh, uh, what happened to the, the amount of money the economy broadly defined. So yes, it may take a few quarters, 1.5 to 2 years, but the excessive money balances eventually will be translated into changes, well, an increase in CPI prices. Mm -hmm. And this is just, uh, again, coming from the study that I mentioned before with a colleague of mine, the two sides of the equation, or the quantity equation that I mentioned before, um, uh, broad money is the yellow, well, sorry, the orange li uh, line, and nominal GDP is the right-hand side of the equation, that's the, the blue line. As you can tell, it's not that they are coincidental, but there is indeed a, uh, uh, a correlation between, between the two. You can tell how, how big of, the, of a divergence uh, we experienced in the COVID-19 uh, years. Mm? That was quite exceptional. Mm? And uh, no wonder that divergence uh, had to be corrected with an increase in prices afterwards. Mm? So this is not just, um, as I said, uh, something theoretical. This is something that we can use for policy purposes. And indeed, uh, uh, the, 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 the last central bank that I can remember that used this framework to make a monetary policy decisions was the European Central Bank up to uh, 2003. It was actually in the official uh, uh, strategy, monetary policy strategy implemented by the, bank, uh, by the European Central Bank. So let's just use the example of the UK economy and let's try, uh, try to use the quantity theory of money in order to prescribe a monetary policy compatible with price stability over the medium to long term. Well, all we need to do is to solve the quantity equation for m, uh, uh, small m for the rate of growth of broad money. So all we need to do again is to solve this equation and then factor in whichever the values you think are best or represent better uh, your, your economy. In the case of the UK, uh, p is going to be the inflation target given to the Bank of England every year, 2%. T for the rate of growth of real transactions in the economy or the real GDP. I'm being very optimistic here, but something around uh, 2%. That's the, used to be before the pandemic or before even before the global financial crisis, the trend, a real rate of growth of the UK economy. But you may claim that is too, too generous. And how about V? Well, V, the decline in money velocity is around minus 1%, as I said before for the US and for many other leading economies. So those are the, the, the figures that I'm um, factoring into this equation. And that uh, once you do that, you will uh, get to this range of growth of money, broad money, compatible with that economy, with a 2% uh, price stability uh, economy. Money should grow, should grow, sorry, uh, no less than 4% and no more than 5%, roughly speaking. 
if you tend to produce too much money in the economy over 5% persistently, that will lead to inflationary pressures. And just the opposite in case uh, money uh, stays, grows at a rate lower than 4% persistently. Hmm? Just um, to give you the context of where we were back in 2021, 20, 20, M at the peak of the uh, at the peak of the pandemic between 2020 and 2021, M4 in the UK grew at 15% on an annual basis. That's uh, well, as you can tell, four, three to four times higher than that rate compatible with price stability. So if you were analyzing these uh, figures back in 2020 and 2021 using the the quantitative uh, approach to inflation, you wouldn't have been that surprised that a uh, couple of years down the line, inflation is where, where it is at the minute. Mm -hmm. Well, this is something actually that we, we did actually, we wrote about it, a colleague of mine, uh, Tim Condon and myself, we published it in, uh, well, it was the IA, the Institute of Economics Affairs published it for us. We took the data from the spring 2020 and get it, uh, got it published in June 2020 and we, alerted of inflation at that time. Inflation about around 5 to 10% uh, for, for the US economy in 20, 2021 to 2022. Mm. And all we did is to use the approach that I just told you about. Mm. So who is to blame for this, uh, for the current inflation episode? Well, this is the state of the equation, or this was, still is unfortunately, the state of the, of the question in the US, in the UK and in the Eurozone. I'm just use, going to use some quotations from the uh, the chairman of the US Federal Reserve, uh, uh, Mr. Powell. The growth of M2, M2 is the broad definition of money they use over there, doesn't really have important implications for the economic outlook. And this is not something he said uh, years ago. This is February 2021. Hmm? Another one, the link between money and inflation ended about 40 years ago, December 2021. If this is the approach this is your, your mindset uh, to, to understand inflation. Well, again, there's no surprise that uh, they didn't know what was going to happen with inflation a few months later, basically. They've been uh, massively surprised by the, by the events afterwards. Mm? Something similar uh, can be said about uh, the European Central Bank. The ECB changed what they call the, the, well, the uh, monetary policy strategy. And uh, basically what they did is to um, give less uh, value to, to, to the information provided by money in assessing inflation. That's something that the ECB used to do uh, quite a lot. It used to, to, to give quite a lot of uh, weight to the information provided by broad money in assessing inflation, but it doesn't, it doesn't do it anymore. And as regards the Bank of England, I'm not bringing any uh, quotes from the Bank of England, uh, but I can tell you that in the quarterly um, report, uh, the official quarterly report published by the Bank of England, uh, the monetary policy report, uh, you may find one mention to money uh, in the whole report, maybe if you're lucky, but most likely you wouldn't find any mention to money. Hmm? So what I'm trying to say is that in the mindset of those making monetary policy decisions in major economies, the US, uh, the Eurozone and the UK, this is not really the, f the effects of uh, changes in the amount of money on prices is not really what they have uh, as a priority. Mm? So what um, major policymakers, indeed uh, central banks, uh, thought at the time, 2020 and 2021, is first that COVID-19 was going to be accompanied by disinflationary effects over the medium term. This is not something uh, short term, no, no. It's going to be uh, something that is going to continue over time. Then in 2021, they had to change the, uh, the assessment of the economy and they thought that inflation was going to be yeah, higher than they expected, but transitory, whatever that, uh, that meant. And then finally, a few months later, they had to acknowledge that they had a, a major policy uh, mistake and they had to start uh, fighting inflation. Mm? But uh, uh, as you can tell, they were not really ready for to to, to address inflation in 2020 or 2021. This is something that uh, Charles Wuhart has uh, referred to as uh, central banks, uh, well, current central banks, they don't really have a coherent theory of inflation, but rather 
a bits and pieces approach to inflation. This is something really, really worrying because the authorities in charge of uh, making policy decisions, monetary policy decisions, don't really have a consistent, reliable explanation of inflation. So this has revealed uh, 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 in the, the latest crisis as a major flaw in their strategies and it's something that you haven't sorted out yet. So we may be in a, uh, we, we may repeat the same errors in the future. And this is something referring to the Bank of England's uh, official uh, forecasts. This is something that I took from the monetary policy report in November 2020 and one year later in November 2021. If you just focus on the banks of England's, the Bank of England's sorry, uh, views of inflation back in November 2020, as I said before, yes, inflation is decelerating, it will recover in 2020, 2021, and it will stay around 2%. Yeah? So yes, it's disinflationary, and it will stay around 2% after 2021. Mm -hmm. And even one year later, again, as late as November 2021, uh, they had to acknowledge that indeed inflation is on the rise, and it may increase up to 4.5, even 4.5, even 5 percent uh, in early 2022, but quickly it's going to return uh, to, to the 2 percent uh, inflation target. And as you can tell in the axis, they did not even consider inflation to be higher than 8 percent. Are you familiar with this? You're familiar with these uh, so-called fan charts. The darker uh, the color, the red color in this case, the, the more probable uh, the, the that forecast will be according to the Bank of England. So it was not even in the cards that inflation was going to be higher than 8%, that it has been, as you know. That's the, uh, that's the extent of the policy error made by the, by the Bank of England in the last, uh, in the last two years. Mm -hmm. And um, to, to give you more uh, evidence about uh, uh, why I think they got it that wrong, here you have uh, these two lines for the CPI in the UK. The blue line is, is core inflation, so overall inflation, uh, excluding for the most volatile components in inflation, uh, energy and unprocessed uh, food mm, items. And the other one, of course, the, the red line is overall CPI inflation with all the, all the components. So indeed, from the summer, at least from the summer to 21, it was quite evident that inflation was on the rise. Still from very very low uh, base, but still it was very clear that the trajectory was uh, upwards. And well before the start of uh, the war in Ukraine in February 2022, inflation was uh, quite a problem already. Hmm? So I'm sorry, the war in Ukraine is not the cause of the current inflation episode, not in the UK, not in the Eurozone, not in the US. Inflation preceded uh, 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 the, the war in Ukraine in, in, all, these, in all these economies. Mm? And even if we, again, if we discount for uh, the effects of uh, 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 the war, if you like, on energy prices, if you just focus on the blue line, core inflation, it's uh, still at uh, something close to 6, 6.2%, if I remember well, above 6%, which is three times higher than the, 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 the inflation target given to the Bank of England. So I'm sorry, there is something else that has nothing to do with the war in Ukraine that is explaining inflation in the UK. And this is just for comparison. The three uh, lines up there correspond to the, the UK, that's the UK inflation, that's the red line. Uh, the purple one is for the Eurozone and the darker blue is for the, is for the US. So the rate of inflation is the, in these three major economies uh, 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 has been pretty, pretty high, much higher than that in other well-developed economies, such as Switzerland, the lighter blue line, and the green line is for Japan. And those economies, uh, we, we claim, at least I do claim, they do suffer from the same bottleneck effects in uh, international markets, if you like, uh, energy prices going up, and yet they haven't experienced inflation as we have. Why is that? Well, if we go back to uh, uh, what, the, uh, the, the, what happened to the amount of money a few years uh, before in 2020 and 2021, guess what happened in the US? This is the rate of growth of money in the US. 
uh, up to 25% on an annual basis in 2021, 25%. That's the highest rate of growth of money since the, the end of the Second World War in, in, in the US. Uh, how about in the UK? Well, 15%. And in the Eurozone, something close to 12%. Hmm? How about the other two economies? Well, the amount of money increased, but not as much as in those uh, three economies that I just mentioned. Hmm? So who to blame for the current uh, inflation episode? Well, I blame the, the monetary policy maker. Now here is depicted as uh, uh, William Pitt uh, the Younger in this very fam famous caricature by James Gilroy. Uh, well, here is representing the power of the state uh, when the state took over the power of the Bank of England to produce more money during the, the war times with France. At that time, obviously, the, the amount of money was um, restricted uh, by the gold standard. So uh, the amount of paper notes that the bank could uh, issue had to be linked to the value of the reserves, the gold reserves held by the Bank of England. Of course, that's not a, that system is not operating <laughs> anymore. So the power of the state of the of the money, money, money policy maker uh, to, to increase the amount of money is unlimited. Uh, theoretically, potentially, they can increase the amount of money as much as they wish. And actually, they proved that point in the, in the, last, two, in the last two years. Mm? So, yes, indeed, uh, uh, I think we should blame the monetary policy makers for, for the increase in inflation in the, last, uh, in the last couple of years, not just in the UK, but also in the Eurozone and indeed in the, in the US. Mm? This is uh, some more data uh, uh, regarding the, the rate of growth of uh, money in the, in the UK. The red line is the annual rate of growth and the green line is the annualized rate in the last three months. So as you can tell, uh, before, before the pandemic, with the exception of uh, an intervention by the Bank of England uh, at the time of the referendum, the, the EU referendum, uh, it was quite stable, around something close to 4.5%, indeed compatible with 2% uh, rate of inflation. And that changed dramatically in 2020 and 2021 with a rate of growth of money close to 50, well, around 15%. Hmm? And now, quite quickly, it's returning to something much more moderate. Actually, there has been a very sharp deceleration in the amount of money in, in, recent, uh, in recent months returning to something closer to 4%. 4 hmm? So if you want to hear more, well, I would be more than happy to take your questions or comments about this, but if you want to hear more about uh, this approach to the understanding of inflation, this is something that we do uh, at the Vincent Center at the University of Buckingham. We, we have a very ambitious program of uh, events uh, uh, considering the effects of money on, on, on prices. And this is something that also the Institute of International Monetary Research has been doing for, for years also based at the University of Buckingham. Thank you very much.